Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever it is you're watching us from. I'm Pastor Jem and I'm privileged and slightly frightened <laughs> to be having this conversation today. So this has been our media month and basically we are tackling issues that the media has brought up or has highlighted in, uh, in, the, re in the recent past and we just wanted to like, give you a church perspective on this. So the first week we started and we're talking on addictions. Last week we talked about abortion. And today we're going to talk about LGBTQ. Now, before you throw stones, <laughs> let me just make two things very clear. So the first thing is that your identity is not tied to external factors. I want to make that very clear. Your identity as a person comes from the one who created you, and that is God. The second thing is that your value and worth is only determined by the person who created you. So the reason why you have value or you have worth is because you're created in God's image. So as we have this conversation, I want you guys to keep that in mind so that you're not, uh, your identity and value is not tied to one thing. And so when we speak on it, you feel like it's an attack on you as a person, it's not. So I just wanted to clarify that. And yeah, I think let's get into it. So one of the things that I really like doing is asking questions. I'm a very inquisitive person and I realize that when you ask questions and you're able to learn, you have understanding on things, um, you give somebody else an opportunity to explain their side of it. So that's one of the things I really love. And even in the ministry of Jesus, we see this many times. People would come and ask him a question and usually they're looking for a yes or no answer because they just want to, you know, misquote you, misrepresent you, or trap you. But the one thing that Jesus was really good at is he'd take a question, understand the question behind it, like the, the underlying issue, and then speak into that. So there's no portion of scripture where you'll find Jesus saying yes or no to anything because he'd discern what it is that needs to be addressed in that space. So what we did is that we decided let's have this conversation um, through asking questions. So we sent out a message and we just asked people in our networks to send in questions that they want to be addressed concerning this. And we got so much feedback, but we're going to try and cover as much as we can in the time that we have today. So Val and Shem are here to help me read through the questions that we have. And hopefully by God's strength, we'll be able to just shed some light on this conversation. So maybe we can start with Shem. Amazing, amazing. So uh, one of the questions, uh, one of the key questions asked uh, is, uh, are people born gay? Wow, that's, that's an interesting one. Um, there's been a lot of conversation on this, a lot of debate back and forth, and there's been a lot of studies done on this. There are people who done research, and at the end of it, the conclusion was, Nobody is actually born gay. Um, being gay is a choice that comes later, post-birth factors. So they attributed it to personality, they attributed it to trauma, the kind of relationships you're exposed to. Um, let me just find some of the things that were said concerning this. Uh, cultural issues, media influence, the family that you belong to. So it's not that you're born that way, it's a decision that is made later, just like everything else. You can't say a child was born here or a child was born straight. A child was just born. But the environment and the things that happen to them then influence how they live their lives after that. Yeah. Amazing. So the second question would be, this would be very interesting. If love transcends abstract things like age and race, why can't it do the same for gender? Wow, hmm. people are really thinking, I like, I like it. Um, so that's a very interesting question, but let me just separate uh, the issues here. Because the thing about love is that the Bible actually calls us to love. And love is supposed to be extended to everyone. So it does transcend gender. And the kind of love that we see portrayed in the Bible talks about selflessness, sacrifice, putting another person ahead of yourself. And the, the greatest uh, demonstration of love is by Christ dying for us. So love is something that each and every person is called to and is expected to do. But what it is that is being asked there is not about love. Mm -hmm. 
it's more about expression of sexuality and now that's where we need to break it down so that somebody has an understanding of what it is um that needs to be done mm-hmm. so the first thing i'd say is that our sexuality is not ours to define that's the first thing i don't want to say and many times you assume that um this just applies to people in the lgbtq community but it doesn't even people outside our sexuality is not ours to define we can't just go around and decide you know what this is my body i can do whatever it is i want with it god already defined what sexuality is supposed to be and where to express it and the how so allow me to just read a couple of scriptures The first scripture that I want us to read is from Genesis 1 and this is at the very beginning a lot of the Old Testament usually is just our fallenness how far human beings can go in their corruption but in the beginning in Genesis 1 then we see what God's plan for us was originally so Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28 and this is what it says then God said let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea the birds in the sky over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground so god created mankind in his own image in his image god created them male and female he created them god blessed them and said to them be fruitful and increase in number fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish in the sea the birds in the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground so the first thing that i'd say concerning this is that god created gender and he created male and female and a lot of times we we tend to think that our existence is just a mistake it's just a fluke so there's no thought behind it but everything that god does has a reason and from this part we we see that the reasoning behind it was because man and woman complete each other as a, as a person you are whole as yourself when you when you fig, when you when you figure out your identity in christ and all that you're a whole person but a man and a woman are very different and that's a good thing because we see things very differently so god created a man and a woman because we are functionally different we are psychologically different and these two people were supposed to come together to make a bigger whole so they complement each other they complement each other so this this was not just something that god did you know just for the sake of it it actually breaks down what they were supposed to do they were supposed to rule they were supposed to multiply they were supposed to increase they were supposed to have dominion so that that's the reasoning behind that so your gender is something that god has sent to you and it serves a purpose it wasn't something that happened by mistake but the second thing that i want us to see is about how we express our sexuality So this is found in Genesis chapter 2 as well but allow me to read it from Mark chapter 10 which is Jesus quoting what Genesis 2 says. So Mark chapter 10 verse 6 to 8 says this. But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one since they are no longer two but one so what does this tell us here this is the expression for sexuality that tells you that it's not just whatever it is you feel however it is you feel like doing it god had a design for it and in and in his design it made sense to supposed to propagate family to supposed to be a safe space to supposed to um bring about like offspring children and things like that but one of the things that human beings are very good at is steering away from what it is that God created and that's what we call perversion so God told us you know what it's one man and one woman and it's it's within this commitment of marriage and they're supposed to you know complement each other grow each other have children multiply rule the earth and then we came and we said you know what i don't think men can be satisfied by one woman we can try and we something decided, else i know so we decided you know what let's add polygamy into the story and then we decided you know what this so marriage tough. thing you know i feel like it's too much commitment mm-hmm. see sex is just a physical attraction thing why don't we just you know express yeah. ourselves with everyone so we brought in the concept of fornication and then we decided you know what who says that women have to be with men why can't men be with men and women be with women 
And so we ended up corrupting what it is God intended it to. And whenever it is we stray from what God's plan was, uh, we find chaos erupting. This is why we find ourselves with baggage, the kind of baggage that we see in society, the confusion that we are growing up with. And that's just because people have steered away. So it, this is not even limited to the LGBTQ uh, community. It's, it's, it, it also speaks to people in general, like everybody else, people who consider themselves straight, your sexuality is not yours to define. So God God puts, puts uh, us together and there are parameters that he put us uh, to express our sexuality. And if we do that, then things are supposed to work. Then we're supposed to have societies that are functional. So that's what I would say concerning that. Wow. Wow. The part you said, uh, man is fast whole. That, that, that was deep. I like that was the first step. Like, man is fast whole. Amazing. So, question three uh, How should Christians respond to the LGBTQ issue? As, as Christians, how should we respond to it? Well, I was waiting for that one. I think <laughs> that's the question I'm asked the most. So, typically, I found that Christians take two stances when it comes to this issue. Okay. There's the side of, this is sin, it's evil, you're damned to hell, God's hate, God hates it, and they're just, you know, fire and brimstone all the way. Sure. And then there's the other extreme of, you know what, uh, Christianity is about love, we need to love each other, who are you to judge, let people be who they are, that's the expression of love, so who are we to judge? Mm-hmm. And usually those are the two main stances. And then there are those people who are just like, yeah, we're not having this conversation. <laughs> like, let's just yeah. bury our heads in the sand, which is the safest thing to do. Sometimes, be yes. neutral. Yeah. yeah, like, you know, you need you need to be in the middle. You have the most friends if you're in the middle. But, <laughs> but we're called to speak on some of these hard things. So there's this side and then there's this side. But for me, whenever I read scripture, I see a third side. And that's what I want to share with with us today. This is okay. this is my stance on this, and this is what I believe represents God's heart in this matter. So allow me to read a scripture, then we can break it down from there. Okay. And I'm reading from John chapter eight, um, verse one to eleven. So this is one of those stories that's really famous. It's the story of Jesus and the adulterous woman. So this is what it says. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Verse 4. Teacher, they say to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. Does it sound like anything that happens today? Anything that you say Always. can be used against you? Always. <laughs> um, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Hey, Jesus was so cool. Some of this wisdom, I'm like, God, I need wisdom like this. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. Verse 9. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your, uh, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. Then Jesus said, Then neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, there are three things that we can take out from this. The first thing is that many times when you're out pointing fingers, condemning people, it speaks on an area of your life that needs to be, to be changed. And the thing about God is that whenever you're going to accuse others, he'll draw his attention to your heart. It's, he's, he's more concerned about yeah. the state of your, of your heart. So one of the things is that these Pharisees were not wrong. This woman was actually she was. guilty. Yeah. She had committed a sin. But the one thing that Jesus does 
is that he exposes the motives behind it. So they didn't care about her. It was not about the woman. If anything, they were ready to kill her. Yeah. But Jesus saw the motive. The motive was not for this woman's life to be changed. The motive was not uh, for the laws to be upheld. The motive was to expose somebody else. So that's the first thing. Many times when we are throwing stones and condemning ours, then we need to sit down and ask, our are our, our hearts in the right place? Mm-hmm. What What is it that we, we need to see from this? So one of the things that I tell people in this context is that, um, I think this is found in 2 Corinthians 5, when it talks about we have been reconciled to Christ. Mm-hmm. So it's not something we did, it's Christ actually reached out to us. And because we are reconciled to Christ, our job is to reconcile others to Christ. Mm-hmm. So when you're out here damning others to hell, are you doing what it is that you've been called to do, to reconcile them to Christ? So that's the first thing that I wanted to point out. But the second thing is this, how Jesus responds to this woman. So he actually covers her, covers her shame. Like she's guilty at all. There's no, there's no, you can look at this where she, she's not, she was caught yeah. in the act. Okay. It's, it's a very interesting story because I'm like, she was not by herself, but yeah. <laughs> so she was caught in the act. So she's definitely guilty. That's not in question. But what Jesus does is he protects her. Mm-hmm. He yeah. covers her shame. These people have come and exposed her in front of a crowd. Yeah. This is something they could have resolved in private, in private yeah. but they came and exposed her. So the first thing that Jesus did is he covered her shame. He, he portrayed love to her. Now, in the past, um, and if we go through our history, you'll see all the kind of things that have been done to the LGBTQ community. And some of these things are not right. And as a Christian, there's no way that you can sit there and endorse somebody else being set on fire, somebody else being stoned, somebody else um, being exposed like this just because you don't agree with them. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing. Sure. This is not this is not Christ-like, and on behalf of Christians, I'd want to apologize for that. For people who've who've hurt you in the name of religion, who've called themselves followers of Christ, but have hurt people in this community. Yeah. So that's what I'd, that's the second thing that I'd want us to uh, that I'd want to say. But the third thing is this: after all this has happened, Jesus has has uh, exposed the motives of the people who who brought her in, and then he's covered her shame. Then now he reaches down to her level Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and speaks to her as a person. This story, the way it's covered, it actually didn't even tell us the name of the woman. That's how inconsequential it was for them. They just thought it was a woman caught in adultery. They They didn't care to know her name, her story, nothing. They just were ready to get rid of her. Yeah. So they had reduced her to her sin, but Jesus sees her. Jesus comes down to her level. And he speaks to her as a human being. And one of the things we see is that he doesn't sugarcoat what the problem is. What does he say to her? I don't condemn you, Mm -hmm. but go and sin no no more. more. So that's the thing. God, God, God sees us where we are. He comes down to our level, not to condemn us, but to remove us from the space that we're in. Mm -hmm. So when God comes into the picture, He'll come and 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 love you and and reveal truths to you, and then He'll move you from where you are to where He created you to be. And that's exactly what we see Jesus doing for this woman. This woman had been identified with her sin, identified with her struggle. She had chosen this life of adultery, but but Jesus comes down and tells her, "Imagine this is not what God had in store for you. This was not His plan for you. Your sexuality is not all there is to you. So go." and sin no more. So he moves her out of that space and 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 uh, allows her to go and live a life mm-hmm. that God has called her to. Wow. So it's just love, but now we're not supposed to condemn the people who are involved. Yeah. That reducing someone to their sin is just so... Painful. Like, there's so much more about you, so it's very yeah. unfair of us to reduce you to one thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you tell someone who is struggling with their sexuality? Wow, that's that's a good question. Um, I think the first thing I'd say is that your identity does not come from external factors. Mm -hmm. 
your identity comes from God, from the person who created you. And it's very easy for us to put ourselves in a box and uh, pick an area of our lives that we identify with most. But that's not that's not how God created us to be. He created us with different aspects of our lives. He created us with personality differences. Your everything about you is actually very well thought out by God. The race that you are, the gender that you are, the time in history that you've been born, the place that you've been born, and all these things come together for a purpose. Mm-hmm. So the first thing is that you need to know is that your identity comes from God and God alone. Yeah. So I can, I can I can have an opinion about you, the other person can have an opinion, but all our voices don't really matter. The only voice that matters is the one who created you because he knows who it is that you're supposed to be. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Allow me to read a couple of scriptures and they just highlight what it is that I'm talking about. The first one is Psalms 139, 13 to 14, and this is what it says. For you created my inmost being, So this is David speaking. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. David understood something about God, that nothing God does is by accident. And David would know this better than anybody else. He's the guy who moved from being a shepherd to being a king. So in our minds, that doesn't make sense, but God knew the the purpose that he had created for him. So when David is talking about this, he's just like, God knew me before I was made. And so I am fearfully and wonderfully made. My gender is is, is for my good. It's, it's, It's to help me fulfill the purpose that God created me for. My color, my gifts, my, um, my, uh, what do you call it, my personality, all those things come together to fulfill our purpose. But the second thing I want to say is that God has a plan for your life. I know the assumption is always that we're thrown onto this planet and we're supposed to figure life out for ourselves, but that's not true. God actually took time to create you for a specific reason. And let me read from Jeremiah 29, 11. And it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, that doesn't sound like a God who is just, you know, going with the flow. Whatever comes today, whatever happens tomorrow, it doesn't matter. It yeah. sounds like he's actually thought through this. And for us, we just see today. We we know how we feel today. We know what we see today. But God sees the future. He sees the beginning from the end. And he's like, this is just a season. But this is what I have in store for you. Yeah. So coming into a place where we understand God has a plan for you. And that includes your sexuality. He had a plan for your sexuality when he put boundaries and systems in place. The third thing I want to say is that you are created for a purpose. You're not here by mistake. Mm-hmm. If if you are here by mistake, then I think we'd all look alike. But God took such critical... <laughs> it's just ridiculous. ridiculous. The fact that uh, you share, you don't share a fingerprint with every, anybody else in this world. Including your twin. I know, including a twin. And I'm like, that tells you just how specific God is, how much time and and thought he's put into this. So there must be a reason behind it. So allow me to read uh, Jeremiah 1.5. And this is what it says. Before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So in in this part, um, God is, is calling Jeremiah into his ministry. And Jeremiah was really young. And the, one, the first thing he said is that, I'm too young. I can't go. I can't speak. And God reassures him. He's like, I knew you. It's me who made you. Yeah. And the reason I made you is that you would be my prophet to the nations. So I don't know for you what it is that God has created you for. But until you get to that point where you you realize that your identity comes from him and then you begin to connect with him to understand why it is that he created you the way he did. What is the reasoning behind it? What is it that he he expects you to do with your life? Then at that point, everything about you begins to make sense. You begin to understand, oh, this is why there are these boundaries. This is why this instruction is given. This is why um, God says do this and don't do this. And at the end of it, it just comes back to what is it that that you believe? So for me personally, I think my life started making sense when I found my expression, 
my identity in Christ. And in that place I understood, oh, there's there's a purpose for my life and I begin to pursue that and I found my purpose and I was like, oh my god, this was not just by accident. I was not just here by accident because I think one of the things I really struggled with when I was younger was fitting in. I never felt like I really fit in. But guys, nobody was actually created to fit in. We are all different and that's yeah. a good thing. It means we can complement each other to do yeah. different things. So if you're here and that's your struggle, I just pray that God would be able to speak into that space that you would allow him to be the one who defines who you are that you'd not listen to external voices uh it doesn't matter whether they're positive or negative but that you'd allow the person who created you to be the one who informs how it is that you express yourself and how it, how it is that you live the rest of your life so i think that's how I'd answer that that's yeah. amazing wow. very very amazing Thank you guys. Thank you for I that. I think we have so many questions but yeah. guys we've run out of time. Again, yeah. this is not a conversation that we were planning to exhaust in one sitting. We just wanted Very to true. speak into it so that we allow conversations to start and yeah. we're inviting you to to reach out to us because for sure we don't claim to know everything. We are also learning, we're also growing. There are things that God has revealed and that's what we share when when we just come into this space but even for us there are so many areas in our lives that we need help in we need accountability sure. in so the the one thing that I want us to remember is that none of us has got everything figured out we all need each other yeah. this journey of faith requires all of us all of us submitting to Christ and all of us working together so allow me to just pray for us as we end this conversation Um Lord thank you so much for just allowing us to begin this conversation on this very hard topic that um usually is offensive to some people it it feels like an attack to others and for others it just feels like an unnecessary uh drama that we're getting involved in but lord we know that you've called us to be able to speak into certain areas of society because at the end of it your plan for for humanity is that all of us would connect to you and that would experience the kind of lives that you created us to experience so for anybody who's watching us today i just pray that lord they'd find their identity and purpose in you that begin to understand that you created them for a reason and that they'd be willing to pursue that that they'd be that'd be willing to pursue a relationship with you and allow you to be the one who defines all these things for them lord i thank you because true joy and fulfillment does not come from external factors but it comes from connecting and knowing the one who created us so would you be with us and would you continue to teach us and guide us and we pray all this believing and trusting in jesus name amen amen amen, amen.